to Local Lens. I'm your host for today, Georgianne Lucier, and I'm very happy to welcome our guest, Matthew Bailey. Matthew is a certified funeral services practitioner. He is the president of Connecticut Life Tributes and a trainer speaker. So welcome, Matthew. Thank you. Good to be with you. And you've got nearly 20 years experience, and I imagine 2020 presented really unique challenges within the funeral services Absolutely. industry. Closing in on 20 years, I started to maybe get a little arrogant and think I finally had this thing figured out. Uh-huh. And then uh, 2020 came along, and we were all uh, back at square one, uh, learning all over again in a lot of ways. You have um, one way of thinking of it would be your services um, address needs that are prior, during, and after a loss, a death. And how did the pandemic affect people's choices, options regarding those three different stages? Yeah, it was a a lot of challenge for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. The the before death period of time that we work with people uh, comes in two different capacities, I guess. We, we, there's part that we call pre-need, which is when we help people do their advanced planning Mm -hmm. and putting affairs in order. Um, You know, people retire or they are doing their wills and living directives and all that and and their attorney says you should do this too so uh, we saw that slow down a lot because a lot of folks weren't coming out and sitting down and and meeting with people in person so um, while we saw them slowing down and actually doing it we had a lot more people trying to do things online and request information because they started thinking about these things Mm -hmm. as, as they saw the world around them um, changing very suddenly and realizing that a lot of people found themselves in very precarious situations when they didn't have a plan in place. The other component of beforehand is when people anticipate a death occurring. There's a loved one who is terminally ill. Mm-hmm. Uh, they might be under hospice care. They're approaching the end-of-life circumstances and situations. Um, and, and that was really heartbreaking in a lot of ways because we just encountered so many families that weren't able to be part of that journey in the way that humans often want to be part of that journey. So the stories we heard from people who were sitting across uh, a window of a nursing home, Mm -hmm. uh, not being able to be in with a loved one, um, to have people who, because of travel restrictions and uh, other family members with health conditions, they weren't able to to be present and, and, and be there. Uh, that was a real hard time for, for a lot of families and a real difficult thing to witness. Uh, the the at-need time of things when a death occurs um, is pretty obvious for a lot of folks because I talk to a lot of people who say I couldn't. it was a year without going to a wake, a year without mm-hmm. going to a funeral. Um, and for a lot of families, trying to find a way to navigate how to address their very real needs uh, that we have as human beings when we lose someone and do it in a way with the restrictions that we all were facing. So um, I say there's no pause button on grief. You, mm-hmm. can't, you can't just stop it and say, well, we'll come back in a year and a half mm-hmm. and address it. So families were really trying to find a way to say goodbye to someone that they loved uh, without that ability to connect with wider community. Um, and I think it helped reinforce the importance for a lot of them about why it is that we do that. Um, and then the after fact has changed a lot where we're seeing people now having services a year after a person passed away, um, which is not something that it would typically uh, be the norm mm-hmm. under, under other circumstances. So, um, you know, we see people, we had a, a service recently where it was the one year anniversary of the gentleman's death. Um, mm-hmm. But now that family members were vaccinated. Um, and, and others were present, they finally felt comfortable uh, coming out. And I, I think we're seeing more and more of that occurring as well. As you think about people's behaviors during this period of time, are there any particular trends that kind of stand out to you as being atypical, different? One thing that I, I noticed that I think uh, we offered for a decade or more, but it was very rare that we would be taken up on. It would be either recording or live streaming of, mm-hmm. of services. Um, you know, maybe in the past once a year or so, a family would have a grandchild who's in the armed forces and overseas and not able to participate, uh, and they would they would embrace that as an option. But for the most part, if we brought it up with people, they were, eh, that sounds kind of funny. I don't really, I don't mm-hmm. like that. I'm not, I'm not interested in that. Um, and that's one thing that I think has really moved into mainstream for, for a lot of folks, and I, I think it will probably stay with us for a while. There are so many aspects of living under a pandemic that mm-hmm. I think are going to change our behaviors more permanently mm-hmm. 
just new habits that get formed and new ways of thinking about things and probably I think certainly one thing is people working from home or whatever yeah. I and mean, just the whole notion of being present right which again with a loss has a particular poignancy and need mm -hmm. as you talk about humans needs yeah and you're well connected throughout the country with your other colleagues in, mm -hmm. in the industry and what types of things did you hear that struck you that maybe aren't perhaps your own experience but stories from some of the areas maybe most hard hit or yeah I and mean, there's a, a variety of them um, as we were uh, sharing and, and connecting with each other about facing things you know my I have colleagues in New York State who were just hit so much harder mm -hmm. uh, we had it rough here in Connecticut I'm not gonna I'm not gonna downplay it was, mm -hmm. it was a long year and a hard year um, but my colleagues in New York um, telling me stories about people calling on the phone and reporting that a death had occurred and them just not being able to respond, not having the manpower, okay. not having the vehicles, not having the equipment, the stretchers, the storage space. And these are large firms uh, mm -hmm. just saying, we, we're sorry, we can't get there. And then hearing how two days later, the same family or the same nursing home would call up and say, can you please come? The person is still here. Mm -hmm. um, and they put a waiting list essentially in order where they said we'll put you on this list and we'll call you when we're able mm -hmm. and we'll you know keep trying to find someone else to help you if you can but otherwise we don't know what's going to happen and then they would call back a day or two later and see if the family was still in need and tragically often they were uh, i have a, a a friend who has funeral homes um, in pennsylvania and new york and he was actually driving three or four hours to New York City mm -hmm. to do transfers to help families because he was the closest provider that they could find. And he still, because of his New York reciprocity, was mm -hmm. able, to, able to assist. Um, what I thought was most tragic is stories I heard about providers. Um, I haven't heard of any in our immediate area, but I did hear of providers around the country that just wouldn't respond. That because of fear, because of not knowing about the circumstances that they were facing, um, a family would call up and they would say, we're not, we're not currently open for business. Uh, mm. Or uh, they would say, we are open, but you have two options. And see, either an immediate burial or a direct cremation. And you can't see the person, you can't enter our facility, you can't gather. Um, and, and I think that uh, that limiting approach uh, didn't help their, their firms and certainly I didn't mean, help the members sure. of their community. Well, and perceptions of sure. services. Did you identify any trends around colleagues I mean that's the the example of going with between you know Pennsylvania and New York mm -hmm. colleagues supporting each other in a different way like we're all in this together kind of you know I, I heard some outreach for um, you know people going to immediate response areas particularly New York when mm -hmm. it when it first started happening um, but there was I also heard about a lot of difficulties with that because you know, particularly here in the Northeast, we have some protective licensing laws. Okay. Um, so I heard of people from other states trying to go and help and not being able to because of the restrictive licensing laws that we have. Would ever think that would be such a big issue, right, to cross state lines? Yeah. You know, part of the executive orders in Connecticut uh, did open up our state to allow other states' licensees to come and function here, but it's a global pandemic. It's not a, it's not a regional problem. Right. So no matter where people are from, they probably have their own, their own issues and concerns that, that they have to address so, of help coming along right, the way. Right, which when you think sometimes with um, a catastrophe, for example, mm -hmm. you'll see linemen all flocking yep. down to a state to, you know, help restore power or, you know, different groups that, you know, maybe medical professionals or whatever that can help out. If, right. But sounds like there were some restrictions that were probably put in place for good reasons yeah. but or well this would be well the, the equivalent intentions. of the the blizzard being in every state in the country so yeah. the linemen are all needed to stay home as you mentioned the pandemic was and is global and grief is such a personal experience a family mm -hmm. experience and what shifts in perspectives are you seeing coming out of this in terms of how people are approaching the need for your services, the um, appropriateness of doing things a certain way. I think that the last year and a half has shown a lot of people the importance of coming together mm -hmm. and the importance of being together. 
And I do a lot of presentations and trainings, and, and um, when I work with the general public, it's not at all uncommon to have the person in the back of the room who says, when my time comes, throw me in the, throw me in the back pile mm -hmm. of the farm and, and don't worry about it and, you know, go on or, you know, just have a dinner and ignore me. And, or Willie um, Nelson saying, roll me up and smoke <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah, exactly. Like, okay. yeah. Yeah. So, but I think that this last year showed us what we innately know as human beings that when we have a death there are certain needs that we have and because of that we have done certain things throughout the course of human history we've we've come together mm -hmm. we've cried we've laughed we've shared stories we've looked upon the person that we lost accepted the reality that that death has occurred and try to um, you know, formulate relationships and, and assign meaning to that life. And that allows us to begin a healthy grief journey. You know, there, there's a certain need that we have to do those things. And I think in recent years, we've seen attempts sometimes, I think, to minimize that and to, and to say, you know, services will be private and no one else is going to be involved. Mm -hmm. And I, I think as the, over the last year where people haven't had the option to gather and to get together and to support... Um, I think we're seeing a, a renewed appreciation for those activities. Do you see any differences with different cultures? I mean, I know there's societal trends around grieving um, that might be associated with a religion, with a nationality. Mm -hmm. Somewhat, because along the way there are you know certain faith traditions and, and certain cultures that are very particular about mm -hmm. how things are done, um, yep. and and it's it's. This is who we are, and this is how we take care of our dead. Mm -hmm. And to have the restrictions placed upon the ability to do that. I mean, there are people who wanted, who've always told their children, when, when I go, send me home. Send me back to the country I was born in. Mm -hmm. And then to find out that that country will not allow people to be flown back in. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden they have to have a difficult conversation about what do we do when we can't fulfill this person's wishes. Or if they said when, you know, grandma was always a part of this church and it was a big part of her life and she volunteered there and then all of a sudden they find out the church is closed mm -hmm. and no one's allowed inside. Um, and maybe the clergy will do a Zoom gathering with your family. That's a devastating thing for a lot of people to have to wrap their brain around. How do people um, grasp, you know, the very essence of trying to fulfill the wishes that someone had under certain conditions mm -hmm. and assumptions and then those conditions are no longer in place such as the pandemic did you find people fairly resilient about shifting or is that very much an individual thing and maybe some family members did and some didn't I think it's very much an individual thing, but I think it was assisted by the fact that we were all in this together mm -hmm. and it was happening in every aspect of a person's life. So, you, you know, if someone has just gone through nine months of restrictions about my children able to enter a school building, my spouse able to go on a plane to be with a sick family member, mm -hmm. you know, and all these other things happen, um, people, I think, got to the point where they recognized our hands are tied in certain ways. I think it also made people exhausted. I mm -hmm. think it also made people very tired. And I think when you know a death occurs, it's always a stressful thing on top of it. So having gone through that period of time of just prolonged anxiety and then to have this acute loss period that you find yourself in, um, in some ways it may be made it a little harder for people than it would have been otherwise. What things do you anticipate going forward might be some f um likely changes that'll stay with us as to how we say goodbye? I, I think that the idea of coming together and gathering is going to take on renewed purpose. Uh, just last Friday, I was at an event in our local PNA park, uh, mm -hmm. and it, it was, there were a lot of people there. Uh, and, and I think there's something happening where people are having this desire to be with others. We just had a, a visitation uh, last evening, and a lot of people came out. And, mm -hmm. and I think it is that appreciation and that ability to, to be with others. Does it last forever? We'll find out. Yeah. Uh, but but I, think, I think that renewed appreciation for the ability to gather and be with others, uh, at least in the short term, is, is going to be notable. Let's think a little bit about some of the infrastructure around the funeral um, industry. So you mentioned the licensing laws that got to be an issue with 
maybe people who might be in a position to help out, but were restricted with being able to provide the professional services. Um, did you identify anything in the way of um, insurance companies, um, people who s provide your supplies, um, just all the things that have to come together to yeah. keep everything moving? Sure. Yeah, uh, all of the above and more. Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I actually... Uh, was the funeral director that responded to the the very first COVID death that we had in the state of okay. Connecticut, and um, that was a situation uh, where there was some paperwork that needs to be taken care of. Whenever mm -hmm. we have a loss, there's things that families have to sign and do. Uh, Connecticut was a state that never permitted us to take fax and email copies. You always okay. had to have a wet signature on things, mm -hmm. even though there's state laws that say electronic signatures have the same force. Vital Statistics was saying that's that's not the case. And this was a, a period of time where someone passes away from this disease and mm -hmm. their family has been exposed to them, is now under quarantine. Right. And I was talking to the state saying, what do we do now? Mm -hmm. and, and like the original answer was like, well, maybe if you get it in an envelope and you tape it on the door and you go back to your car and then you come, I was like, this is not. Oh, I have one of those extended <laughs> things. <laughs> <you're saying>. Slingshot, <laughs> you know, this was not a, um, a good solution. So. You know, Connecticut began to allow us to use electronic signatures on things, okay. which is, you know, we went surging into the late 20th century mm -hmm. with that. But, you know, hopefully something like that stays. But we also had, you know, we had families that plan on using a life insurance policy um, to, to help pay for their funeral. And then no one at the life insurance company is answering the phone. Is the policy in force? Right. You know, I think how we do distant work uh, will probably change forever. I think mm -hmm. that a lot of the companies hopefully have things in place where if something does happen, they're able to continue to function. Um, the supply source was a real challenge and continues to be a real challenge for us. So almost daily, I'm getting letters in the mail saying that because of the cost of raw materials, we're increasing prices from mm -hmm. a lot of our suppliers. Uh, for a period of time, uh, casket companies were having a real hard time keeping up um, with the manufacturing uh, requirements. Uh, we would put an order in and they would start, do you really need it by tomorrow? Could you take it next week? Is mm -hmm. this other option? You know, they were just trying to figure things out. A lot of the urns that we um, have, if, particularly if they're metal, a lot of metal urns are sourced from India. Uh, with India's uh, really tragic numbers uh, with COVID infections and death going on, the delays for their production have gotten very, uh, prolonged. So, mm -hmm. you know, we have some families keeping, I want a little keepsake and they're waiting two months, maybe longer, who knows until, until it comes through. So the PPE was a huge thing in the beginning. Mm -hmm. A lot of funeral homes may have had a little bit on, uh, on site, uh, not a lot. Um, I was fortunate enough to have uh, worked alongside a former, um, mortuary affairs officer in the army who, okay. when, when Ebola came along, uh, he got us ready, so we had all this extra PPE and, and mm -hmm. things in place. And also, I, I ordered more before everything happened, um, just kind of seeing it down the pipeline, um, to the point where we were actually mailing out PPE care packages across the country and delivering throughout the state to other providers that just didn't have anything. So there's a good example of helping your fellow right. colleagues. Right, right. Yeah. Share what you have. I mean, we, we looked at it, and I, I said, I think we have enough. Well, we'll like... I started doing some math in my head, and if it's as bad as they think, mm -hmm. I said, I think I get through at least these months, and hopefully by then there's a plan in place and kind of roll the dice. And yeah. by then there was a plan in place because Good. the state started securing, you know, large quantities mm -hmm. and distributing it to, to providers. So. so let's talk about you in terms okay. of how you arrived here with us today. And again, thank you for coming. Sure. So you graduated from Catholic University of America, yep. a funeral services institute. And you train and speak on professional topics. Mm -hmm. So did you always plan to go into the family business? I did not. Okay. Uh, not at all. A lot of people assume that I did. Um, my dad grew up above our funeral home on mm -hmm. South Elm Street when the family moved there in, in 52. Um, and I think people just always kind of saw it as a, a natural thing. Mm -hmm. He never put any pressure on myself or my siblings to, to join the business. He told us when we were six, seven, eight years old, if you'd like to join me, I'd be proud to have you. And I don't think he ever brought it up again. Mm -hmm. So there, there really wasn't any pressure. Uh, for me, I didn't know what I was going to do, um, but I wasn't going to that direction until one summer uh, before my senior year of college. I came home late from school, uh, started working for him because all the other uh, 
summer jobs seemed to be taken. Mm-hmm. And that was the first time I was really exposed to it, where you know people would come up to me and say, we had this awful experience that we don't know how we ever would have gotten through it without your dad. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it really hit me just the impact that he had working with families in our community. And it was after working with them that I decided to uh, change course a little bit. What was bit. your major? Uh, I was studying politics. Okay. Yeah. Everyone in Washington, D.C. studied politics, it All seems. Right. So. <laughs> okay. And so what aspects of your work do you find the most rewarding professionally? Uh, you know, journeying with families and helping them get through those days around a loss. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, you, you look around the world and you have all these people who always tell a family, if there's something I could do to help, let me know. Mm-hmm. Um, and families never respond to that. No one, no one comes up with a week later calling you up on the phone saying, bake me an apple pie. That's right. not what they're looking for. Um, but I know that, you know, I have a, a unique skill set and ability to work with people where I can get them through those days mm-hmm. and I could help um, navigate that process with them. The thank you notes that we get from our families, um, it, it just blows you away sometimes. I mean, in, in a society where people no longer write thank you notes. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I talk to people who tell me about their doctor who found polyps and saved him from cancer and they never sent a thank you note. And right. then we get a thank you note from a right. family saying that, you know, we never could have could have gotten through this without you. Um, and it, it just really fosters a, a connection and a relationship that is really, really valuable. What is it that you think you provide that creates that framework for people feeling so supported? Mm-hmm. I think it's a number of things. I, I think I think I'm blessed to work with a very good team of, of individuals that are skilled and, and know what they're doing mm-hmm. and provide confidence and a framework to help people navigate those days. And just to provide assurance for them that you don't have to know every question to ask, you don't have to know everything to do, that we're going to guide you through this. We're gonna mm-hmm. explain your options, we're gonna explain your choices. If we have to have a conversation with your family as you navigate what the pluses and minuses of each choice are, we'll, mm-hmm. we'll help you do that and we'll respect whatever decision that you come up with. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, work along with your traditions, with your preferences, with your budget, with your family dynamics mm-hmm. and all those other things that might complicate it. And also just trying to be really creative in our thought process about how we embrace families, of, of recognizing that funeral service today is not the same as it was in 10 years ago, 20 mm-hmm. years ago, 50 years ago. Um, and just trying to be, you know, really unique and uh, help people put together something that, that's meaningful and, and tells the story of their loved one. So I probably could imagine what some of the coursework you did um, at the uh, Catholic University of America, but this um, Funeral Services Institute, what's the range of training that someone gets? Very broad. So okay. there, there, there's uh, your basic core curriculum classes where you're studying accounting and small business management. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of science classes, so chemistry, microbiology, mm-hmm. anatomy, embalming. Uh, there is the um, soft sciences, so you know, funeral service history is mm-hmm. in there. Um, grief, uh, grief studies. It, it's a real broad brush. Obviously, embalming, um, all the the aspects that go into the the technical side of things too. So, mm-hmm. and then a lot of law classes, just because we have a lot of rules and regulations and things that you know, both federal and statewide that we have to address. And how long is that program of study? So it depends on which approach you're taking. Connecticut's requirements is a minimum of an associate's degree. Okay. So because I already had a bachelor's degree prior to going into the program, I was able to do, I did the diploma program Mm -hmm. um, because I was able to avoid a lot of the the core curriculum, English, math, and all Mm -hmm. that. So that was an intense 12 months, but it was uh, 12 months with a lot of classes along the way. So. Okay. And I talked about you being a speaker and trainer. Just mm-hmm. share a little bit about what topics you address, mm-hmm. what venues you sure. do that in. So I, I talk uh, to a lot of different funeral service associations. Um, I've, there, there's three big national associations that we have within our profession. I've done, I've done trainings for all of them. Um, I, primarily, I talk a lot about um, service standards and, and uh, funeral celebrants. So funeral celebrants are individuals who are trained to meet with families, um, have a conversation with them and craft a service or ceremony that addresses the life of their loved one. That could be completely a-religious. It could Mm -hmm. have religious elements to it. It could be anywhere on the spectrum. But we have a lot of families, um, 
you know, the, the second, if, the, if they were a church in this country, the second largest one in the nation would be what they call the religious nuns, who are those that don't identify with a particular... N-O-N-E. Yes. Not N-U-N-S. Correct. Okay. Exactly. Not to be confused. Yeah. Maybe say nuns instead okay. of nuns. But, um, you, you know, for a lot of those folks, if they come in and it comes time to have a funeral and, you know, going to a house of worship is not part of their normal routine mm -hmm. and they were married by a justice of the peace, it might not always feel most appropriate for them to go and have... A clergy person present. If they're the second largest, you know, group in a community, you know, how do we address them? How do we make sure that we have something that helps them heal and begin their own grief journey? So uh, I do a lot of um, just training and conversations about incorporating that into, into funeral service. And this would be like conferences? Mm -hmm. and, okay. so there's state associations, um, there's, there's private groups as well. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of cover the, the, I'll be Everything shut down for the year, but I'll be in Atlantic City this year, and in, in Providence, uh, Nashville, a couple different places uh, beyond that. So as we wrap up, circling back to the pandemic, how has it affected you most directly? I was really tired. Uh, you know, it was it was an exhausting year. Um, mm -hmm. I I experienced, I think, more emotionally challenging events, deaths of children and things like that, which. Uh, were violent and will stay with me mm -hmm. as long as I'm alive. But with those situations, you knew if I get through next Thursday, my professional involvement will be completed mm -hmm. with, with this. You'll, you'll, you knew you had a time frame to work with. Uh, with COVID, you might have five deaths on a day and leave at 10 o'clock at night to finally go home and then a half an hour later the phone would ring and it would okay. ring three more so times sheer overnight volume number one, so yeah right? so it was just it was just the exhaustion of the non-stop mm -hmm. uh that we experienced for certain okay. periods of time so it was a uh, it was a tough year uh, mm -hmm. but it was it was you know really tough for the families that yeah. that we served so and a lot of growth for you i would yeah. imagine yeah it was uh, hard one Yep. Well, thank you very much, thank Matthew. You. I totally appreciate you sharing your professional experiences and wisdom. My pleasure. Okay, thank you. And again, I'm Georgianne Lucier, the host for today for Local Lens. Thank you for joining us.